It is Wednesday, January 18th, 2023, and we're here tonight at the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin, to study the book of Genesis. We'll be in Genesis chapter 33 tonight, so I want to invite you to take a Bible and be turning with me to Genesis chapter 33. We'll be there in just a few moments, but we're very glad that you joined us tonight. We're glad that you found us, and we want to invite you to join us in person for Bible study and worship. We have a Bible class this coming Sunday morning at 9.30. We're halfway through the book of Ephesians and then hopefully you can also join us for the worship assembly at 1030. We're just getting started on a study of the book of Hebrews, so that would be a great time to jump in. If you have any questions about what you see or hear in class tonight, we would love to hear from you. If you have anything that we need to be remembering in our prayers as a congregation, or if there's some way that we can help you, we want to invite you to give us a call or send a text to 608-224-0274 or send an email to fourlakeschurch at gmail.com. And if you haven't yet subscribed to our YouTube channel, we want to invite you to do that as well. And that way you can stay up to date with anything that comes out on that channel. We'd love it if you could do that. Thank you very much in advance for uh, for subscribing to the YouTube channel. Um, it, it almost seems tonight as if I'm having... Uh, something of a of a light bulb moment. I don't know if that's just me or if you can see that too, but uh, we've been playing around with the lighting in my home office, so uh, let me know what you think. We'll see if that's too distracting. If it is, uh, feel free to put a piece of black duct tape on your TV screen at home. Maybe that'll help, or uh, maybe we'll take that off, but uh, just adjusting the lighting. We got a brand new camera came in the mail yesterday. Uh, webcam and just to try to upgrade that a little bit to give a slightly better quality so we'll see how that goes I've recorded this class I think three or four times already we had a little bit of an issue with um, the audio and the video not matching just a little like a millisecond off yesterday and that was not the new camera that was before we did the new camera so I'm not sure what's up there if it's too irritating just close your eyes <laughs> and stay with us but uh, we'll be looking at Genesis chapter 33 in just a moment so back to Genesis tonight the book of beginnings written by Moses and now we're looking at the life of Jacob so we've been looking at Abraham Isaac and Jacob over the past several months so now we're on to Jacob Jacob has pretty much tricked his brother by taking the birthright and then he fled from his brother's wrath who had vowed to kill him and he heads up to Haran where he picks up several wives and now after 20 years he's finally on his way back home last week we left off with Jacob uh, sending several waves of gifts on ahead of himself uh, to try to soften his brother's heart and try to change his mind about killing him. And then on that last night, right before he expects to meet his brother, there is some guy who wrestles him all night long. But the guy is more than a guy, as we learn in that passage. He seems to be some form of God, or at least a messenger from God. And uh, when this messenger, or when God himself, cannot get away from Jacob, this being, whoever he is, dislocates Jacob's hip. But even then, Jacob still doesn't let go, and he is a stubborn fellow, so he demands a blessing. And that being then changes Jacob's name to Israel, which was a reflection of the fact that he has struggled and prevailed, not only with God in a sense, but uh, pretty much with everybody else around him in his life up to this point. Today then, we pick up with Jacob now ready to limp across the finish line, we might say, and this is a much shorter chapter, basically describing some travel and the reunion between these two brothers. Uh, at the beginning, Jacob is now ready to make this final push to meet his brother, the same brother who had promised to kill him 20 years earlier. So let's start tonight by looking at the first paragraph. This is Genesis chapter 33, verses 1, 2, and 3. Genesis chapter 33, verses 1, 2, and 3. Then Jacob lifted his eyes and looked. And behold, Esau was coming, and four hundred men with him. So he divided the children among Leah and Rachel and the two maids. He put the maids and their children in front, and Leah and her children next, and Rachel and Joseph last. But he himself passed on ahead of them and bowed down to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. Now let's remember Jacob has already divided his people into two large groups. He's already sent several waves of gifts on ahead, and now it's down to his immediate family. And I'm thinking this might have been just a tad bit awkward to arrange your wives and children in order of least importance, putting the most expendable family out there in the front. 
And yet that is exactly what Jacob seems to do here. They're just about ready to meet Esau. They know Esau is coming with 400 men. Uh, so Jacob puts the maids and their children out first. They are the most expendable in his family. I think that's kind of what we could assume here from what he does. And then he puts his least favorite wife in the second tier. That is Leah along with her children. And then he puts his favorite wife, Rachel, along with Joseph in the rear. So that would be the, the safest position. They will be the last to be killed. Uh, if Esau ends up being on a murderous rampage, or they might have the uh, best chance of escaping simply by being farthest away from the front. But at this point, though, Jacob has the guts, thankfully, to step out in front. So he bypasses these three groups of family, and he steps up to meet his brother. And as he does, he bows down to the ground seven times. We know that seven was often thought to be an, uh, a perfect number in the ancient world. And this is repeated several times in the Bible. Seven is important, a uh, number representing completeness, completeness. But what a change in attitude from the way that Jacob left this land 20 years earlier. Uh, 20 years earlier, he kind of left in a huff. He was on the run. Uh, not a very godly man, but a lot has changed over that period of time. So let's continue tonight by looking at Genesis 33, verses 4 through 7. The next paragraph, Genesis 33, verses 4 through 7. Then Esau ran to meet him and embraced him, and fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. He lifted his eyes and saw the women and the children and said, Who are these with you? So he said, The children whom God has graciously given your servant. Then the maids came near with their children, and they bowed down. Leah likewise came near with her children, and they bowed down. And afterward, Joseph came near with Rachel, and they bowed down. So we finally come to this long-awaited meeting between these two brothers, Jacob and Esau. And Jacob does not get murdered by his brother. That is certainly a highlight of this chapter. Uh, perhaps Esau's heart had softened soon after Jacob left 20 years earlier. Maybe he had had a very slow, gradual change of heart at some point during those 20 years. Maybe Esau's heart was softened by the waves of various gifts that Jacob sent on ahead. Or maybe, maybe Esau was ready to kill his brother right up to the moment he saw him in person, but then changed his mind at the very last second. We don't really know the answer to that. But we do know that the meeting goes well, of course, much better than Jacob had ever anticipated. We find that Esau runs to meet his brother. And I would just note here, Jacob does not run to meet Esau. If you remember, Jacob's terrified. He thinks he's going to get killed here. Uh, but thankfully, Esau does the running, and they hug, and they kiss, and they weep together. I was kind of thinking about the father uh, who was waiting out front for the prodigal son to come home. Remember the parable Jesus told? It almost seems like a little bit of a similarity here. Uh, but after that initial meeting where they hug and kiss and cry and all that, uh, Esau looks around. It's probably obvious that these are not servants. And so Esau wants an introduction. That's kind of the way I would take that. And Jacob explains these are children that God has given to him. So notice again that little advance in spiritual maturity. He is attributing these blessings to God. And then once again, also, we should note Jacob refers to himself as Esau's servant. Uh, so an attitude of just extreme humility here. And remember, these are twin brothers, so they are the same age. I, I, we don't always remember that. Uh, but the maids come up with their children, and Leah comes up with her children, and then finally Rachel and Joseph step forward, and the whole family bows down as this sign of respect for Esau. So let's continue by looking at Genesis 33, verses 8 through 11. The next paragraph, Genesis 33, verses 8 through 11. And he said, What do you mean by all this company which I have met? And he said, To find favor in the sight of my Lord. But Esau said, I have plenty, my brother. Let what you have be your own. Jacob said, No, please, if now I have found favor in your sight, then take my present from my hand, for I see your face as one sees the face of God, and you have received me favorably. Please take my gift which has been brought to you, because God has dealt graciously with me, and because I have plenty. Thus he urged him, and he took it. After the initial meeting, Esau's first question is about all the stuff that Jacob had sent on ahead. He wants to know, uh, what do you mean? Uh, what do you mean by sending me all, this, all these things, all these herds and flocks and all this? And uh, Jacob explains that he was basically trying to make up for stealing the birthright. I think that's how I would summarize that, to find favor in Esau's sight. He knows 
um, that his brother's very angry, so he's trying to make up for that, trying to pacify him a little bit. And we have a typical back of back and forth here, similar to what we might see today within a family or between friends. Maybe when somebody gives somebody else a gift that seems to be too much. Oh, you didn't have to do that. Well, I wanted to. No, take it back. It's too much. No, please accept this and back and forth like that. And what's interesting is that Jacob says that he sees his brother's face as the face of God. And to me, that's a little bit over the top. It may be for you as well. But for Jacob, this huge gift of flocks and herds is nothing compared to the stress that he was feeling over meeting his brother. Uh, he is completely relieved by his brother's reaction. And I would compare this almost to an act of worship. If we think of going to God in worship, he has the right to reject that. And so when he doesn't reject our worship, we're extremely grateful for that. And so Jacob's attitude here is, God has been very good to me. I have plenty. And so I'm asking that you please accept all of this as a gift. And eventually Esau does accept it. Well, let's continue tonight by looking at Genesis 33, verses 12 through 14. Genesis 33, verses 12 through 14. Then Esau said, Let us take our journey and go, and I will go before you. But he said to him, My Lord knows that the children are frail, and that the flocks and herds which are nursing are a care to me, and if they are driven hard one day, all the flocks will die. Please let my Lord pass on before his servant, and I will proceed at my leisure according to the pace of the cattle that are before me and according to the pace of the children until I come to my Lord at Seir. At this point, Esau is ready to get this over with. He's had enough here too, so let's go home and let's head back home together. But Jacob is concerned about the children and the flocks and the herds and this huge group of, of people and animals that he's uh, has with them. Many of them are nursing. They can't make this huge trip all at once. And so Jacob suggests that Esau go first and that he'll come along and, uh, you know, at his own pace and catch up later. I'm just trying to put myself in Jacob's place here for a moment. I, I think I might need some time by myself to recover from the stress of this situation. I may need some time to uh, be on my own, maybe to process what just uh, happened here. And then the other thing about the kids, traveling with children. If you guys have traveled with little children, I think you may understand what Jacob is saying here. We made a trip many years ago when our kids were really little. We made a trip over to see my in-laws near Dayton, Ohio. And uh, our youngest on that trip, as I remember it, screamed at the top of her lungs anytime the car was moving. So the car moved, she would scream, and the car would stop at a rest area, a restaurant, whatever, she would stop over and over. And this trip that should have taken seven, maybe eight hours, it stretched on to nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. It might have taken 15 hours because we were stopping uh, over and over again just to keep our own sanity. But I'm just thinking, putting myself in Jacob's place here, I think we understand the challenge of traveling with uh, groups. Uh, but especially traveling with little children. And so he's basically saying here, nope, you go on ahead. I'll meet you uh, when we get home. So there's that, traveling with children. And then there's also this, uh, please give me just a little space here, because I think Jacob probably, in his own mind, probably needs some time to decompress and kind of to process what's going on. And I think that might explain what comes next. So let's continue then by looking at Genesis 33 verses 15 through 17. Genesis chapter 33, verses 15 through 17. Esau said, Please let me leave with you some of the people who are with me. But he said, What need is there? Let me find favor in the sight of my Lord. So Esau returned that day on his way to Seir. Jacob journeyed to Succoth and built for himself a house and made booths for his livestock. Therefore, the place is named Succoth. So Esau wants to leave some of his 400 men with Jacob, but Jacob doesn't see the need for that. Uh, in my mind, Esau maybe wants to leave these men behind to kind of keep an eye on Jacob. That's a possibility. Maybe there's a lack of trust, uh, or it may be just out of helpfulness. We don't really know the answer to that question, but I think there's a good chance, as I said just a few moments ago, that Jacob uh, just needs to be alone for a little while. And I, I know... Um, there is something to be said for traveling alone and kind of sorting out your thoughts on the road, just a little peace and quiet and so on. So they separate completely and Esau heads out with his men and Jacob comes along later at his own pace, ends up setting up camp in an area known as Succoth. So it's not a permanent dwelling. There is a house involved, but uh, just for his 
uh, flocks. He builds these kind of shelters. So it's not really a permanent thing. It's not barns and, and that, uh, but more of a pit stop along the way as they regroup. And I'm not sure exactly on the timeline here, either a few months, maybe even a couple years. I'm not sure, but uh, it's definitely not their permanent uh, dwelling. So let's conclude then by looking at the last paragraph here. This is Genesis 33 verses 18 through 20. Genesis 33 verses 18 through 20. Now Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from Padan Aram and camped before the city. He bought the piece of land where he had pitched his tent from the hand of the sons of Hamor, Shechem's father, for 100 pieces of money. Then he erected there an altar and called it El Elohe Israel. And again, as I said earlier, we don't have a timeline here, but after settling briefly in Succoth for a little while, uh, Jacob now comes the rest of the way on this journey to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan. And this time it seems to be on more of a permanent basis. So he purchases land at this point. So he's not just camping out somewhere, but he does pitch his tent and then he purchases the land that he's camping on. And he builds an altar to the Lord, naming it in honor of his new name, God, the God of Israel. Well, this brings us to the end of Genesis 33. Jacob and Esau have been reunited after 20 years, and Jacob and his people have now settled in the promised land, so they're back. And this sets us up for some drama in Genesis chapter 34. Just uh, an atrocity, terrible thing is going to happen in our class next week, Genesis 34. We hope to come to that next Wednesday, if the Lord wills. But this leads us in that direction with him purchasing property from this certain family, and that'll play into our lesson next week. In terms of a practical application of tonight's lesson, trying to answer the so what question. Why is this in the Bible? Why did we take the last 20 minutes to study this? Well, it seems we learned something, first of all, about the importance of reconciliation. The idea of coming back together after some kind of a conflict. And when we think about this being a split between twin brothers, that had to really hurt. Maybe you've had conflict with your siblings. I've been very blessed that uh, uh, my relationship with my sister has been pretty much conflict-free, at least on my end of it. You know, I don't know, uh, but very peaceful, I would say. But imagine two twin brothers um, angry with one another. At least there was anger from one to the other. And not just anger, but murderous threats. And so that's a serious situation to have these two young men growing up together with all of this... Uh, all of this between them, this pent-up anger, this frustration, and the cheating, and the, and all of that. So these two men are then separated for 20 years, but in the end, very thankfully, they do in fact come back together. And there are at least two big parts of this reconciliation. First of all, I want us to notice that it's Jacob who takes the first step, isn't it? Jacob is the one who heads back home. And so there is a lesson there in taking the first step. Somebody's got to make the first move. And the other part of this is that Esau reacts to that first step in a good way. And of course, Esau very easily could have held that grudge. Uh, he could have murdered his brother the first time he saw him coming in there. Uh, but instead, as we noted in tonight's class, Esau's heart seems to have softened over time. And so it seems to me we have some good reminders here from Jacob and also from Esau to take the first step toward reconciliation whenever we can. And then on the other hand, also to be eager to forgive, to be eager to work things out with somebody. And these are both New Testament concepts, aren't they? It's not just something from the old, but it's the new that really applies these things to our situation today. Uh, Jesus, of course, for example, says in Matthew 6, verses 14 and 15, For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your father will not forgive your transgressions. Is it pretty important to be forgiving? Absolutely it is. That Our, our forgiveness from God is dependent on that. It's conditional. Um, and so it's important then that we be eager to forgive. And with this in mind, let's be thankful that the conflict between Jacob and Esau seems to have worked out quite a bit better than the conflict between Cain and Abel. Remember, we studied that just the first few chapters into the book of Genesis with the uh, uh, the murder of Abel by his very angry brother Cain. So thankfully, uh, that did not end that way with Jacob and Esau. 
So there, there's some lessons here about reconciliation. There's something else I hope we notice tonight, and it's not the main point of this chapter, but it's something ongoing that'll cause some continuing issues in this family. It's something that's come up already and it has already created a number of issues in previous generations in this family, and that is the favoritism shown in this family. Remember how Jacob sends his maids and their children on first, and then Leah and her children, and then finally Rachel and Joseph? Now let's just think about this, if we can, from the kids' point of view. Do kids notice stuff like this? Now let's think about all those kids seeing Joseph protected there at the very end. Well, they're put out there on the front lines, we might say, almost as sacrificial offerings. They are expendable, we might say, in the eyes of their father. But Joseph is protected back there with the favorite wife at the very end. And I think that makes an impression on these other children. And it would have to, to grow up with that and to see that. And it also makes an impression on Joseph as the child who is favored. And that'll play itself out over the next few chapters here. And all of this will lead to just some serious issues really throughout the rest of the book of Genesis. And so there's a lesson there to be very careful about not showing favoritism within the family. And with that, thank you for joining us tonight. I hope to see you this coming Lord's Day at 930. We're halfway through the book of Ephesians and then after class. Uh, plan on coming together with us at the worship assembly at 1030 as we jump back into the book of Hebrews. But let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we praise you tonight as being the father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Tonight we're thankful that you've told us about the reconciliation that takes place between these two brothers. Tonight then we think to our own lives and to any broken relationships that we might have, and we ask for courage as we do whatever we can do to make things right with those around us as much as we can within our own power. We pray for courage to take that first step as Jacob did, and we pray for the wisdom to know how and when to forgive, just as Esau did in this chapter. Tonight, Father, we pray for our relationships, relationships between parents and children, between brothers and sisters, husbands and wives, between us and all the people that we see around us, that we interact with on a daily basis, those we know and love at school, at work, or in the neighborhood. And Father, we pray that we would love others just as you have loved us. We know that this is one of the greatest of all commandments. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. We come to you tonight in his name. Amen.